Dr. Amanda Craig. What's going on? Good to have you on. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, anytime we can talk about these crazy teenagers and what we can do about them and the tweens, right? We got We want Excited. to talk to people yes. like you. Yes, it's a fun time. Yes, yes it is. Well, you want to start off with some fun questions? Yes, let's. All right, let's do this. Uh, I want you to think back to your childhood. I want you to tell me uh, what was either number one, your favorite pastime as a young girl, or okay. maybe your favorite sport that you like to play growing up. Okay. I'm going to go favorite pastime. All right. Uh, born and raised in Minnesota. Oh, freezing cold. Okay. Okay. So you've got the freezing cold. Cold. The other thing we had was really hot, humid summers. Yeah, it's weird. It's very weird. So we had very distinct seasons. And I loved the hot, humid summers. And it seemed like when I think back, it was always sunny in the summer. And so mm -hmm. playing outside, riding my bike, you know, you know how they say back in the day, we went outside all day long and came home <laughs> at dark. I yep. really did that. Same. And I just loved it. Me too. The rule was be home by dinner. Yes. And then, and Ours then after be home by dark. Yeah. Be home by dark. Like my, uh, my mom and, and when I used to hang out with my grandparents quite a bit too, they'd be like, when the street lights come on, you better be home. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. You know, it's really funny though, is I, you know, we, I, it, me and a, me and a good friend were actually talking about this. So, um, I, I'm coaching my son's, my seven, my seven year old's basketball team right now. And, okay. uh, and one of the other dads, we've gotten to be really close cause our boys are close. So I see him all the time. And, uh, it, it's really weird like this. So the, weird by meaning like you grew up that way where you just went outside. Like I remember actually being seven years old and we just ride our bikes like with our friends through the neighborhood, like seven years, second grade. And now it's like, that's kind of like unheard of for a lot of parents. Right. Or like even getting your kids together sometimes has been hard for people. And, um, me and this, me and this guy, we were talking about that. I was like, you know, cause I, we've had his son over a couple of times and he's like, man, we need to do more of this. I was like, yeah, we need to do more of this cause kids need to get out. And like, so last night, past few nights, even though it's cold here right now, my 10 year old, seven year old been going outside every night playing basketball and they're like, oh, so awesome being outside. And we're like, yeah, when we were your age, all we had was outside. <laughs> right. We didn't have like the video games that you guys were tempted with or the iPads. Like no one had that. We had Atari and that got old yes. after, you know, so yeah. All right. So playing outside and all that, did you, were you raised with siblings? So I did. I had a sister. Um, she was five years younger. So we were kind of always different developmental stages, but I definitely had friends that I'd ride around and we had this bridge over 35 W and and this is amazing because I'd never do this now, but we would walk up the stairs of the bridge and then we'd hoist over the railings and you could sit on like the cement. There was a, a gap where you could sit on the cement of the big um, that held the bridge up. And so we'd sit there and we'd watch the traffic go by. I mean, amazing. Right. There's, right. There's super supervised for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that those those were good times. Be like, hey, you want nowadays though? He's be like, hey, you want to go find a bridge and watch some traffic? And the kids would be like, uh, no, I don't want to do that. That sounds great. Right. I'm but, gonna sit here on TikTok if you don't mind and scroll yeah. and be in 20 second clips. And yeah, thanks though. So let me ask you this: What was your drive and motivation to get your PhD and 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 do what you're doing for a living? Mm. Well, I think. Growing up, I wasn't a good student. Um, I found school hard. I didn't really um, find a passion until I got into the psychology classes. And once I had the psychology classes and I went to my own therapist, I found a place that really energized and excited me. And I've loved the profession. I've loved learning about behavior and emotions and what happens in the brain, what happens in the brain between people. I remember in my master's program, I took my first family systems course and I was sold on how important relationships are to people's well being. 
And it just, it was so intriguing to me. And I just, I kept going and I went for my master's and then we do a post master's certificate in marriage and family therapy. And then I went on to get my doctorate in family psychology, but it's amazing stuff. It is. And the conversation never gets old. It doesn't. It's like, uh, I mean, it, it's a fascinating topic. You know, I, I, uh, let me ask you this. W was this something that you were motivated by maybe things that you experienced in your upbringing that you just wanted more understanding around, or was it just more around that once you got involved with the classes and the content and, and the things you were learning, you just got so excited by, by the, by what you were learning, you just wanted more. Um, I think it was both. I'll, I'll tell you in, um, 1987, the twins won the world series. I remember that it's because they played the Cardinals. Good memory. I remember. I was watching that. I mean, I'm from, I live in St. Louis. I vividly remember that. That's hysterical. So <laughs> I was in, I think, seventh grade. They let us out of school early to go to the parade. And instead, my friend and I went to Target and we shoplifted. No way. <laughs> we did. And Minnesota being a pretty progressive state for mental health, instead of um, community service or other, you know, punitive consequences, they actually put us, put me in a diversion program. And I met my first counselor and going and having someone to talk to and just like getting feedback that I was normal and I was a good kid and it was life changing. I think it was really built my self-worth and I remember from that day on, I was really sold on being a counselor. Interesting. Isn't yeah. that something? Yeah. Not only do you shoplift from Target, but you, you pick the one area where the Target headquarters are at. So like, you're like, you're like going for like the Swiss bank of targets, right? That's where you go to shoplift. That's what you did. <laughs> well, that's because every block had a Target. So like, right. that's where you went and, and you're right. It's headquartered there. And once you move out of Minnesota, you realize not all targets are made equal. <laughs> Very true. I miss Very those true. Minnesota targets. That That's a really cool story. So it sounds like this was really, you know, birthed from a really good experience that you had with, with a counselor that maybe poured into you and maybe even edified you a little bit. Well said. That was so yeah. true. That's really cool. And, and now you, uh, you've written this amazing book. <laughs> The, 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 the title alone is, I, I would just love for you to share the title, the title alone. And I love the headphones on it, by the way, I have to know like what idea, who came up with that idea, but share the title of your book and why the headphones? Yes. Right there. I love these headphones. Okay. So it's, who are you and what have you done with my kid? Right. Connect with your tween while they're still listening. So listening. Yep. Right. You have that. And then also um, you know, when you're working with your publisher, they'll give you some ideas, you know, they'll ask you what kind of ideas you have and they, they'll come up with some options. And when they, you know, the headphones were one of several options I had and why I loved this one. So is when my son was nine, he had the exact same pair in light blue. So nice. ironically, he had it in this color. I'm but pretty sure my boys headphones. had the same. Yeah. And, and as you know, having teenagers, the headphones moved from that shortly after to something more cool and, you know, kind of like what you have on now. But it really signified for me that tween and that like early adolescence just before they, they rise to that, those bigger shoes, if you will. I love that, you know, but I, I love the fact like, like, what have, like, what have you done with my child? Because like, I think all parents, yeah, you know, I've actually, here's, here's a really interesting, I think, take on this whole thing. You and I were talking before we hit record. And I, like I said, I've got a 17 year old, a 15 year old. And I would say actually overall from, from a connection standpoint, like we feel insanely connected to these young men, which is really I, I i scratch my head to be honest because but i also think the nine years of doing this podcast and learning from people way smarter than me like yourself has really really helped because i always look on this side of the microphone is like oh my gosh like what what can i learn from dr amanda today right and my wife and i have really taken a lot of these lessons seriously and, and connection has been something that's been ultimately important to us at the same time 
I always like to challenge people when, when they say, you know, like, I, I now know, or at least I, I feel very, very strongly about that when someone comes up to you, because this happened all the time when we had little kids, yeah. you know, and I would say, especially for my in-laws, they're like, I'm like, oh, I just love this stage. You know, they're nine, they're eight, they're not seven, eight, nine years old. And they'd be like, well, you just wait, you just wait till they're a teenager. They won't want anything to do with you. And they're terrible and they're mean and they're this and they're that. And I, I always tell people now that if people are telling you that, don't, be very cautious of buying into that. Because I honestly think if you're doing the right things, not that any of us are perfect parents, but if you're doing some of the right things, your chances of that connection will still be, be there within the teenage years and even more so if you're proactive with it. But that's not to say that they're without challenges. I know that before we hit record, I was telling you that over the past three months, my 15-year-old and I have noticed like he's definitely has, even though we've got a good connection, he's definitely spending more time with friends now. He's always at the gym with friends or he's he's hanging out with friends they're going out to eat or they're doing the movies. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh, like there are some weeks where I'm just like, I feel like we are ships passing in the night. And I like, I was telling my wife just last night, I was like, I, I really like miss him. We have a date night actually this Thursday, we're going to go to the gun range and shoot guns and do dinner. Um, but it's, um, it's something that I have definitely felt here recently. That's been difficult, but I would love for you to share just for those parents who are maybe not in the tween years yet. Mm. Like what are some things that they could be doing right now? Like that's, you know, six, seven, eight, nine year old, 10 year old range. Yes. Um, so I have a seven year old girl and I thought this book wouldn't be applicable to her for a few more years. And yet I'm finding it so applicable now. Interesting. Because my favorite tip of all, if there's nothing else you hear today, I call it curious questions. The best thing we can do to build connection and closeness and just like a foundation for the adolescent years is to be asking them curious questions about them. So I always give the example of instead of asking, how did you get a C? Why did you get a C? Instead, you say, wow, I saw you got a C. What do you think of that? Because what we really want to do is get them thinking, get them sharing with us how they see the world, how they feel about the world, what kind of things come to mind. They feel known and it builds more of a trust from from us to them. So they feel they can trust. They feel like we're going to be there for them. And it just comes in this simple, simple way of asking them questions and getting curious about how they see the world. And we start doing that when they're little guys and girls, you know, five, six. It's like, what do you think of that? Was that a win, lose, or draw today? Wow, you missed the ball. What was that like? Oh, you got hit with the ball. How how did that go? What happened? Right? Anytime we can get curious about them, they feel valued. And so I love that idea of just showing up and, and like, where are we curious about our kids? How do we get to know them? And probably part of why your your 15-year-old is out so much is he knows you're a secure place for him to land. So he's willing to go out into the world and check it out and see what's out there because he knows he's safe to come home and have people there that have his back. I appreciate that. I, I love that that uh, that suggestion on on being curious. So basically what you're saying is, so wait. Are you are you saying how was your day is not the best question in the world? I don't know that you're going to get a lot. Fine, good, busy, boring, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I I love uh I love what we call in, in this house we call them generative questions, you know, where we ask just super deep questions like tell me about a time today that brought you to life. You know, tell me about a time today where somebody was kind to you. What did they do? Or somebody you were you were kind to, you know, and asking them just really deep questions. The other thing too is I I love this approach on questions where you have like a red flag. Like maybe it's not a C, maybe it's an F on a test. And I think our our knee-jerk reaction as parents is be like, what the heck, man? Or girl, right? What what the heck? Like why what's this F? What's this all about? Right. And then that's probably the opposite of connection, correct? 
Absolutely. Because what we do is put our kids on guard, right? On defense. And so now they're going to have to do a move to get out of trouble, right? And that's where we get the lying or the withdrawing or the arguing because it's not safe for them to really unpack why the F or what happened today in school. They seem upset because we're telling them, like, stop talking to me that way. Don't do that. And it just doesn't offer like that safe space. And so, so I love the, your questions because it gets at that, right? That more yeah. curious part of who they are. Tell me, so you, you use the word safe twice. Tell me about the safety aspect when it comes to connection. Yeah. So, you know, we often think safe, physical safety, that's a right. piece of it, but it's also emotional safety. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating. And when I um, first started writing my book, I was looking at teenagers and as I was doing my research and doing a lot of couples work, the thing that really hit me was the, the tween brain. So kids between nine and 12 go through this huge brain sprouting and all their neural networks are blossoming like spring. And that's pretty cool because it means they have more complex thoughts and opinions and feelings. They see kids more socially and relationships in a kind of new context. And so that's really exciting. But what that also means is they're a little insecure because this is the first time a lot of this has happened for them. And so imagine if they feel emotionally safe, right? They feel calm in their brain. And if they're calm in their brain, their heart is at rest, right? They breathe easy. Their shoulders are down. In contrast, if we yell at them or tell them they can't get C's or they need to do better, or we have that um, stern voice tone, right? You'll see them. They'll get tense. Their heart might beat fast. They get into fight or flight mode. And so when I'm talking about safety, I'm more talking from that emotional safety of regulating or calming their nervous system so we can be in active relationship and not in a flight or fight scenario. Does that make sense? A hundred, excuse me, a hundred percent. Uh, you know, we, we call this, uh, you know, in our community, creating an environment of psychological safety, fee free from blame, pain, and shame. That's uh, right. But, but I think one of the battles for parents, and I'm, I'm sure you have probably extensive uh, tactics that we could use, or, or even just may, not, not necessarily even tactics, I would say an understanding. I think a lot of what parents fear is that, well, it's, you know, so like, I'll give you an example, right? You, you come, you, you pull up your kid's report card and they've got an F in a class and you're like, holy crap, there's going to be hell to pay. Like my, and I think it's not that we want to punish our kids because we want to see them miserable. We want to send a, we want to, we want to teach a lesson that this isn't acceptable, that this could lead to this and this could lead to that. And so when we, and I think one of the battles that we face as parents is like, well, if I create a conversation around this that feels safe, are they really even going to learn the lesson whatsoever? Or am I just being way too easy on them? Am I letting them off the hook? Am I being like a softy? Which I think is actually quite frankly, the opposite. You can, you can have both, I think, but I think it's parents don't, most of us just have no clue in the understanding of how to balance both. Oh, you're so right. Remember when you say that um, Charlie Brown comes to mind, remember the teacher? Wah, 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 of course. Wah, wah, right? That's wah, what wah. they hear when we start in with the lecture. Right, right, right. So, no, they're not taking that in and learning and going to do different because they really didn't even take it in. But the other thing, and I hear Parents say that all the time. So I'm supposed to roll over and just let them run the house? Absolutely not. There, there does need to be structure and safety. That's important. Um, and safety in that context of boundaries or limits in how much screen time they have or, um, you know, having to come to dinner, right? Dinner is one of the most important times of the day for families. 100%. And so... When we're parenting out of fear, odds are our message doesn't get through. 
because we're dysregulated and their system is going to dysregulate with us. So it's going to be too kind of at conflict. In contrast, if, we, if they're calm, their brain can actually take in messaging, right? Their brain is actually working the prefrontal cortex, which is the thinking, the critical analysis, the pros and cons list. And it's very underdeveloped at this age, which is why they make poor choices and offensive behaviors, right? But if we can get them exercising that part of their brain, they're going to learn. They're expanding a muscle. In contrast, if we're arguing with them and they're dysregulated, their limbic system and stress response part of the brain is active. And it actually puts pause for the prefrontal cortex. So we don't really gain. There's not much upside to the yelling with them. There's just not a great message taken, and we both feel bad after. I never have parents say, I feel like I really won that argument. Right. Right? And I never have heard a kid say, oh, yeah, I see the error of my way now. (laughs) Right? Like, it just doesn't come there. Do you think an actual, quote-unquote, lecture is more effective if you put the lecture in curious questions? Okay. Yes, I do. (laughs) And in fact, what I'll often say is, you know, like make it smaller, right? Like a long lecture, you're going to lose your audience. But if you can give a sentence or two, really drive home the point you want. And then I always say, put a tail on it. Now ask a question. So it's something like, you know, you were on the screen all day yesterday, and I just don't think it's good for your brain. Would you agree or disagree with me? Do you even know what I'm saying when I talk about your brain? Not really. I mean, if I'm putting myself in the kid perspective right now. And then I can say, well, your brain is reacting to the video game. Do you know how? I'll probably be like, no. No. Well, when you're on video games, it it activates one part of your brain. When you go outside and you hit the ball around, it activates a different part of your brain. Do you think they feel different when you play baseball versus when you're on video games? I would say yes. And most kids do in my office. Mm -hmm. The other thing kids will say is um, they know the dumb factor, they call it. Meaning they know when they've seen too many episodes on Netflix of that show, or they've been playing the video games too long, or they've scrolled too many TikToks. Like they'll say, I feel dumber. I feel like I've lost some smarts. So they know. And and now if we've got our kids to say that to that point, now they have learned. They have grown and they've gained some wisdom. And do you think that increases or decreases their self-confidence? Well, if they're the ones saying it, it's got to increase it, right? Right? Absolutely. Because yeah. they're owning it, right? They're owning it and they're making yeah. sense. Right. And they're thinking through it. And it's kind of cool. Whenever you come up with the right answer, so to say, it feels good. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we did it without shaming or blaming. Right. right. And all of that. It's amazing. Can we can we talk to the parents who have maybe had a, a track record of blasting the kid? Right. So like, I mean, like, let's just so like I grew up my background was, was like, I literally had to think on my toes because if, you know, if the truth came out about like, whatever, like that I was up to, like there was hell to pay, like there was hell to pay either way. It really didn't matter. Like I just got absolutely blasted when I was a kid with like shame and guilt. And even at times was called names. Like it was just really, really crazy. Right. And, but it also, when, when my, even if, like my mom would come to me and ask me a question and she would do it nicely. I'd always be like, Oh God, what is the agenda here? What is about to happen? If I tell the truth, what am I, what's good? Cause it would, it would snap like that. So I think, you know, a lot of people in our generation, I say me and you were kind of raised that way. We, we were raised with 
you know, some iron, you know, a little bit. Like, I think our parents did the best job they could, but right. they were also probably replicating what they grew up with. Yep. And so I think we probably have some parents out there and quite a few, to be honest, that are probably marching to that same beat because they just don't know any better. And maybe they're listening to this podcast right now and they're like, oh my gosh, like, I just, I've been doing this for so long and I've been kind of like, you know, running this kid in this house with like this iron fist. And, but I, I really understand that that's probably not the right approach, but now if I go and try to have a conversation with my kid around curiosity or engaging them in a conversation, it's probably going to be like pulling teeth. So for, for those people, what, what advice do you have when you're really just trying to reinvent this entire conversation in connection with your kid? I love this. And what I use is the analogy of a cat. Do you have cats? I have dogs. All right. A lot of people seem to have more dogs than cats. That's so interesting. But for those who have cats, they'll totally get this. If you, if you chase your cat, the, ch the cat will run. And that's kind of what you're describing in that parenting where you've chased the cat that's so many point. times that now they see you and they disappear. Mm -hmm. And you're never going to catch a cat, right? They're fast. They can climb. They can, you know, move, move quickly from side to side. You won't catch them. But if you sit down and you give them, you put a bowl of food next to you and you let them come and you let them eat, you don't touch them and they go away and they'll come back for more food. And then at some point you might put your hand out and you might pet them, but it's going to take time. And the same concept with kids is when you've chased them for so long and been in this power struggle, it's going to take time to repair it. But each time you sit with them and maybe throw out a compliment, maybe throw out a curious question. And, and most importantly, those times when they're expecting you to lose your cool, you actually ask them a curious question instead. Each of those times you will build trust, right? That emotional safety. And eventually they will let you pet them, but it does take time to repair. The mm -hmm. other thing in that same spirit is um, the power of amends, right? I, I was so exhausted tonight and I lost my temper and that was not your fault. And I don't want you to take that personal like you did that. That's my responsibility. And I'm just really sorry because I know it doesn't feel good to be on the receiving end. Yeah. You know, more, more to what you just said, I, I had this incredible uh, licensed family therapist. He also wrote a book as well. You might have heard of him. You, you, can't, you can't forget his name. His name is Figs O'Sullivan. Have you ever heard of Figs? No, but that's a nice name. <laughs> Obviously, like he's from Ireland, but he lives in Hawaii now. But he, he came on the podcast. This was like a year and a half ago now. And I'll never forget one of the things that he said was the the strength and the trust and the connection in any relationship is actually not in trying to execute that relationship without mistakes. It's right. actually in the, it's actually in the repair. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, he's like, think about it. You know, you can't be in a relationship and it be mistake free or someone doesn't face plant or you don't hurt somebody's feelings or you don't betray trust or something. Right. He's like, that's actually not where the mortar and the bricks of the relationship actually lies. It actually lies in how do you go repair it? How do you go rebuild that trust? How do you own things? How do you apologize? And I was like, he's like, so that's good. He's like, think about that. That's good news for all of us because we put so much pressure on ourselves to, I can't screw up in this relationship, but you're going to screw up. But that's not the point. It's actually how you rebound. Is that, is that your experience oh, as well? A thousand percent, whether it's my experience in my office or in my home, and I'll tell you that works with partner relationships too, mm -hmm. right? That is not a teenage parenting, teenage trick or tip. That is like all relationships. There yeah. will always be conflict and discord or disconnection. And it's the power of repair that brings us closer again and deeper. Love that. I'm taking notes as you talk. I, I've, I've taken meticulous notes as you talk. Aww. You said the power of repair what again? Oh boy. The power of repair? I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> it just I think it's that it's yeah, I mean, we'll have to go but yeah, it's basically the power of the repair is what connects us, right? Totally. The power of repair does. It connects us and it deepens the relationship. 
Got it. Okay. Right. Cause if we've actually had a problem and resolved it, I know that if that happens again, what we'll do, we'll repair, yeah, we'll repair. it. We'll resolve yeah. it. You'll be in it with me. You're not going to leave me. You're not going to shame me. You're not going to embarrass me. Right. You're going to work through it with me. And for teenagers, they're actually more apt then to go out into the world and take healthy risks <laughs> because they know even if they make a mistake, their parent will be there to support them and have their back and work through it with them. They're not alone. I love that. Yeah. So we, we, we've done a really good job here of, of talking about the emotional connection, you know, coming uh, to the conversation with curiosity, creating this psychological safe environment, you know, even when poor choices are made or bad things happen. Um, it's why it's important to calm down the brain because then the heart is at rest. I love that as well. Uh, all these beautiful things to create this wonderful foundation. I, I want to move just a little bit forward in the more of the teenage years and some of the things that, you know, obviously we see with teenagers. So if you have a 13, 14, 15, 16 year old kid, chances are they have a phone, right? Which means they have a connection to the outside world. They have a connection with their friends. You know, they're, you mentioned TikTok, which by the way, whoever invented that, I literally just, I would rather eradicate them off the face of the earth because it just drives me nuts. But, but here nor there, it's, it's here to stay. But as our kids get older, I, I, I know, you know, now doing this work myself and as you do too, that it's actually a really good thing for teenagers to pull away, right? Because it's showing yeah. that they're, they're growing, right? They're becoming independent. They're, they're becoming their own individual, but it also stings a little bit as a parent. And I, I know at times, especially my two older boys, we have a great connection, but there are times where I'll be in the same room with them and I'll just, I'll so badly want to talk to them. And I know that they're in the midst of, you know, chatting with their friends over text, or maybe they're watching something, you know, especially like after they get home and they're just trying to decompress for like that 30 minutes or whatever. But I so badly want to talk to them, but I, I, I'll sit myself in the presence of the room without necessarily like, hammering them with, with questions of curiosity. Cause I mean, even now, like my kids, they, they, like they, they, they know my shtick, right. And I'd be like, Hey, you know, so tell me, uh, tell me something interesting that happened to you today or tell me the best part of your day or, or to, and, and they'll kind of like, look at me and they'll smile and they'll be like, you know, like, like that, like the little kids will tell me all day long, but like with the, with the teenagers, sometimes I have to get super crazy creative with the questions. Right. But they know what I'm doing. I mean, and they know that I'm just trying to strike a conversation with them. But I mean, I gotta admit, you know, it, it's hard. Like I just, I want so badly to just talk to them, but I also know that, you know, there's we're at a different stage, and some it's like the cat thing versus the dog. Now that you say that, right? It is. It's such a cat, and it's funny. So my 14 year old, same thing. One day. I, I wasn't his favorite person. I wasn't his go-to and he didn't want all those questions. And when I start in with my curious questions, same thing. He's like, hop off. Hop then, off. Is that what he said to you? Hop off. Hop off. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> and I know in his language, what that means is you're right. in, you know, you're in my space. You need to like back up. I'm not talking. I'm into something else. And I'll tell you, my heart breaks. I've had to kind of sit back and I've had to not pet the cat and definitely not chase the cat. And the, the other day he said, I'm going downstairs now to play video games. And he plays the video games and he usually has some friends on FaceTime, but none of their cameras are on. So I'm so confused by that concept, but whatever. So he's got the kids and he, he says, I'm going down to watch video games or play video games. You can come down if you want. And he walks off and like, that was the biggest invitation I've had in my And now if I chase the cat, I go down, I start talking and I start talking to his friends on the FaceTime. I start asking questions about that. No, 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 no. Right. I've been invited into the space. So I sit, I let the cat eat. I might pet the cat. I probably won't do much big movement though. And it is, it's a different, I tell you my book works for zero to 12 and 18 to 80. 
But the teen years, they're a different animal because they do want to flex new muscles and spread their wings and they really want some space. Yeah. And if they want that, we've done a good thing. Mm -hmm. But it is so heartbreaking as a parent to like, to watch that and just experience they they grew up, they got older and, and like, I'm so proud and so happy. And then like, there's some grief and loss in it. I miss the nine year old. Yeah. So. I hear you. you know, we, we have, we have kids right around the same age and experiencing the two different worlds as we speak, as you and I are recording this, we get it. And you know, what's really fascinating too, is so my wife, you know, like I'm, I'm more of the conversationalist and, and my wife is probably more introverted. And my, my 15 year old who you and I are talking about is, um, he's more like my wife, he's introverted and he and my wife are insanely close, like, which ab absolutely fascinates me because like, he's this big 185 pound, just burly, tough football player that w just wants to absolutely annihilate people on the field, but he loves his mom. And like, he'll come home and like, just, he has a hug from her every day when he comes off the field. He, he's got this girlfriend too. He, my wife is the first person he hugs. I'm like, holy crap. Like they, they just have a really good connection. Yeah. And I, I've asked my wife this, this, these questions. I'm like, Hey, I'm like, how do you, how do you get him to open up to you? And she's like, honestly, she goes, I get him to open up by never forcing him to open up. Like, I don't ask him questions like you do. And I'm like, well, what do you, what do you do? Like, what do you do? She's like, well, I'll give you an example. She's like, there are times where he's in the car with me and he'll talk my ear off. And there are times he doesn't say a word, but I don't press him either way. She's yeah. like, there are some times where I might sense something's going on. And what I'll do is I'll just simply reach over and just kind of like rub his arm or like, kind of like rub his shoulder for just a second. And then she's like, it's like clockwork within about 10, 15 seconds. He'll start talking to me. And I'm like, really? That's all it takes. She's like, yeah. She's like, I don't have to say a word. I just have to There's like, let cat. him know that I'm there. That cat. Oh my God. It's right there. I didn't even realize that it's the cat. Right? Yes. And it's so that. true. I mean, my son will pop in the room out of nowhere and have this big story. La, 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 la. And then he'll fly away as quick as he came in. But that's, that's their connection. And they do appreciate that sounding board or that moment. They do appreciate that. Yeah. They also are really geared towards social relationships and kind mm -hmm. of finding their new normal. Yep. It's a bigger world. It is a bigger world. What about, um, can we talk about maybe an extreme? And I'm not sure if this is included in your book or not, but like where, uh, you know, I've been doing this work now for, you know, gosh, nine years. We, we've got a lot of men who, who do life with us on the daily. And we have men who are like, whether it's, you know, like in particular men. So it's actually two different scenarios that I'll present to you. One where men are really trying to connect with their teenage daughter. And it's, it's a struggle for them. Like, they're just like, dude, like, I just don't know what to do. Like, she won't open up to me. Like, I don't know how to talk to her, like all this other stuff. And then on the other flip side of it, and I say, you know, I'm not trying to stereotype boys. I mean, I mean, I have four of them. I just see it more is all. And what I mean by this is like where a, a young man will start to go in a very dangerous direction with some choices that he's making. And the, the mom and the dad are like, oh my gosh, are we too late now? Are we too late to the party? Is there any way we could like somehow get this kid back on the straight and narrow? And I'm not talking about anything like horrible, but like, you know, like maybe they're, well, I don't know. It depends on your, your interpretation of horrible, but like maybe they're trying substances, maybe they're yeah. drinking, maybe they're, maybe they're doing like light type of vandalism. Maybe they're ding dong ditching people and running yeah. away or Things like that. So it's a really two part question. You know, dads with daughters who who really are having a hard time connect, and then you know, dads with sons who are just like, I just need to get this kid back on track. I love it. I'll um, start with the boys because it's normal for kids to veer outside what we want them to do. Like they're gonna take risks it's part of their development to see like, where are the boundaries? And so that there's something normal in that. And I, I like to think in con if we want to make it really concrete risk and protective factors. So if my boys or if our boys are having, um, 
their friend group is vaping, right? They're not doing well in school. Um, we get a lot of emails from the teachers. They're not in sports or extracurricular activity. Those are all risk factors. And the more kids have of those, the more they start to feel bad about themselves and tend to veer more towards risk factors. Interesting. Where, so, where, yeah. No, I was just going to say, so it's, it's, sounds like, I mean, there's something to be said when kids are in environments like, like sports, for instance, you know, that they're, they have something that they're shooting for. They're around maybe other like-minded teammates that are, we share in a common goal. You know, this is what we're doing, but anyway, yeah, keep going. You're spot on, right? And in contrast is the protective factors. An adult in their life that really values them. And it could be someone at church. It could be a music teacher. It could be a coach. It could be an uncle. It could be a buddy's dad, right? Or mom. But an adult in their life that they value and feel valued by is a protective factor. Um, having activity, not just sports. Some kids don't like sports. Some boys don't like sports. But maybe they like band or art or music or poetry, like finding something that inspires them, they're passionate about, and helping them kind of play with those muscles is a protective factor. Because, you know, having friends that are into good things or doing well at school. So if, if our son is, you know, the one getting the worst grades of his group, that's not all bad, right? Like, sure, we'd like him to be top of the pack, but he is hanging out with other kids that are valuing education and working towards something, and that is a protective factor. Mm -hmm. And the more protective factors our kids have, the more they do veer into feeling more self-confident, feeling more worth or value in the world, and so when we see our kids going down those, you know, our boys in particular, those roads, you know, we can see how we can massage maybe some new activities with them or um, maybe encourage some new relationships, maybe introduce them to other adults or spend time with other families that we value their family values so that our kids are getting exposure to those protective factors as well. So you mentioned this term protective factors, and I'm guessing really what that is, is, is positive things in their life, correct? And oh. things that keep them off the, I would say the, the path that's dark, correct? Yeah. And then and the risk factors. People, places, or things. Okay. Yep. Very good. Awesome. What if we, let me ask you this. What if we, and I'm actually just thinking of an individual that I know personally where the guy is like, Oh my gosh, like I've tried to get him back into sports. I've tried to, you know, do this, or we've tried to do that. Like I just, and nothing's working. Have you, um, have you had success with other parents like that where they just come to you and they're like, Dr. Amanda, like nothing's working. What do you, what do you think? What, what would you advise them to do? So again, people, places, and things. So maybe it's other people. The other thing we really want to be mindful of is mental health. So it mm -hmm. could be there is a, um, a depression or an anxiety, for instance, or an OCD, right? We're seeing that in our adolescence for sure. And so it may make a lot of sense to bring them to a therapist or bring them to the church counselor or the school counselor and just um, do, or the pediatrician, to do a mental health screening to see if there's something bigger going on here. Because oftentimes kids will start with maybe some mild depression, they'll start vaping or using alcohol, which exacerbates the depression and creates some angst. And then they feel bad about how they feel. So now the anxiety is bigger, the self-worth is lower, and now the depression is higher. Right. So we do want to rule out um, any kind of mental health issues that may be needing more intervention like therapy or even medication. Got it. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank Fair. you.
And it, it's very simple too how you lay it out like that. Cause it, and when you're emotionally attached to your kid and the situation, all that, it's, it's so hard to just think logically through it. So that, that really know, is very so helpful. Scary. And you it know, is. if parents have a propensity towards depression or anxiety, there is a genetic disposition there. True. Or maybe a grandparent and it was never diagnosed. But all mm. of those things will impact our teenagers. And so it's something to just um, kind of be cognizant of. Got it. Okay. And what about, what about dads with daughters? Like dads this one. Daughters. Yeah. Dads with daughters. What about that one? <laughs> I love this question because I think as girls, and we see this a lot, girls get older, they start maturing. You don't want to do rough and tumble play anymore. You're not really sure like how to engage there. I had a dad this morning and he said, I don't want to talk about makeup and I don't have anything to add about hair care, right? There's just such a disconnect in, in the value or the, the interests and hobbies, right? And so dads tend to veer away a bit and then moms kind of get in there and take over and whether it's conflict or whether it's closeness, that relationship seems to be more prominent. And what I would say is dads are so important to daughters because dads give girls the message of how, how boys should treat them, how they should be expected to be treated. Um, and how important they are in the world, right? So when dads show up and it might be simple stuff like, hey, you want to go to Starbucks, right? Or um, I heard this new song. I heard, you know, I saw this article on Taylor Swift, right? And you text it or an yeah. emoji, right? Thumbs up emoji. Was a day this or this? Or, and dads always have a hard time with this one, but going to the mall. Mm -hmm. Right. Like engaging with them, whether it's music or hanging in their room and just being around, asking them for a dinner or a lunch. Girls want dads involved. They're not yeah. really going to reach out. But if you come, they will let you be with them and they will share with you. Yeah. What I often I see that. is dads are in, almost intimidated by reaching out that. to their daughters. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I don't know what she wants to do. I don't know what to say. It's funny and it's, it's, it makes a ton of sense and it's okay, but lean into it, right? Just start a conversation or just put yourself out there a little bit and, and it'll go better than you think. I love that. You were talking about how your seven-year-old is a Swifty. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, so I, I have boys and I had no clue what a Swifty was until like a few weeks ago. <laughs> and I, th I think you'll appreciate this story because it will it'll really hit home. I have, a, I have a good friend of mine. He also is one of my coaches in, in our group. And uh, I met him for lunch last month and he's wearing, he's got two teenage daughters and a teenage son. So all, all teenagers. And I, he's wearing a Taylor Swift t-shirt and I'm like, dude, what are you wearing? And he's like, Taylor Swift. He's like, I, you know, me and, uh, me and, you know, my girls, we, we went to the concert, you know, a couple of weeks ago. I was like, please tell me you didn't go to Taylor Swift. And I'm just like, you know, I'm giving him crap. Right. right? And, uh, and I was like, dude, he's like, he's like, actually, he's like, you know, it's weird, man. He goes, I never thought I'd say this. He goes, but I like Taylor Swift. And I was like, I looked at him. I was like are you kidding me right now? Like, who are you? What have you done my friend? He's like, actually, let me reword this. Okay. I'm not the biggest Taylor Swift fan, but you know what I am a fan of hanging out with my daughters because they love Taylor Swift. That's and he's cool. like, and they love, he's like, this is the third concert we're going to this year. We've actually traveled for two others. He's like, Taylor Swift is actually responsible for bringing me and my daughters together for some of the best times we've had. And I'm like, He's like, he goes, he looks at me, he goes, you don't get it. He goes, because you've got a football right. that your kid loves to throw with you, or you get on the wrestling mat with your older one, or you go out and play soccer with your other one, or you go play basketball with your seven-year-old. He's like, I don't have that. Yeah. He goes, but I do have Taylor Swift. He goes, and if it takes Taylor Swift to be connected to my daughters, so be it. And I was just, after he said that, he said it was so much confidence. Yeah. And I was just like, holy crap, dude. Yeah. 
Okay. I, I see it. I see what you're talking about. I get it now. Okay. <laughs> That's amazing. And like, good for him, right? He took the time he invested. Yeah. He saw what was important to them. Right. And he went into, he went outside his comfort zone. Yeah. I love that. Cause that's yeah. exactly what it takes. I agree. You know, get, get your hands dirty. So I know we're kind of coming up to the end here, but I want to ask you this, what, what have we missed? If anything that you think is important or meaningful that we need to share that we haven't yet. Oh boy. Okay. Um, I really want to emphasize it's not, you, you don't have just one chance. So even leaving okay. this podcast and you walk away and you take one of these tips and you go try it and it doesn't work, don't give up, right? It's, a, it's, it's the long run, right? And so hang in there because you will see the fruit of your labor by putting in and trying things in a different way. You will see it. And so don't let frustration get you. So just because one thing doesn't work, you're saying we have more chances, right? Totally. Yep. I love it. Actually, I have one more question for you about, about dads with daughters. Cause I think, um, I'm just curious. I don't have daughters, but I'm just curious. What would it, what's the impact do you think? And I know we're kind of globalizing or stereotyping like every daughter. I'm not trying to do that, but just from a, from a dad to a daughter dynamic, if a dad just came to his daughter and said, can I just tell you, like, I just love you. And I just, I really, really want to just connect with you. And to be honest, like I've never raised a 14 year old girl and to be quite honest, I'm lost and I don't know what to do. Like, is there any, any guidance that you can give me that would be helpful? What do you think that that would do? Um, I think, I think the reaction dad's going to get is probably some giggles and maybe some <laughs> teasing and, oh my yeah. gosh, I can't believe you asked me that. Get out of here. <laughs> right? That's what you're going to get. But I think yeah. that daughter is going to feel so good mm -hmm. that her dad thinks of her and cares about her and just told her, I'm trying. I don't know how. I don't know how to get it right, but I am so wanting to, and I love you and you're important to me. And, and yeah, you'll find to... she'll come around later, right? She'll yeah. come around because now she knows there's something there that she wants to tap into. Just something really endearing about just being honest and perfect and not having the answers. Oh right? my gosh. Right. And like, let it be messy like that. I don't even know what yeah. to do, but I miss you. Yeah. Right. I it feels that. good. Yeah. I actually did that with my 15 year old. Like I said, we've, we've been, it's, it's really odd. I, I injured my knee, um, about three and a half months ago and I actually had to have surgery three weeks ago to fix it. And my 15 year old and I, like our pastime is, is the gym. Like we worked out all the time and that was like, it's just amazing. Like we just, we, we were each other's best workout partner and then I got injured and then he started going to the gym with his buddies. And you know, it, I, I had this conversation with him the other night. I, I went downstairs and said goodnight to him and I was like, Hey man, I was like, I, I just want to share something with you. And he's like, okay, what? And I was like, I just miss you, man. I miss you like terribly to be honest. And I just said, what, what would an epic night for you and I be? if we couldn't work out, like what, can we go do something together? He's, and he looked at me, he's like, well, yeah. And I was like, well, it's been a while since we went to go shoot guns at the range. I know you like doing that. I was like, can, can we go do that and go grab dinner? He's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. I was like, great. I was like, but I had to like, there's that part of you, I think as a parent and especially as a dad, it's like, oh my God, like I don't want to come across needy. Yeah. <laughs> But I also want to make him feel like, hey, I know we haven't connected, but you are insanely important to me at the same time. I'm not going to I'm not going to leave that to chance. I'm not going to leave that on the That's table. Right. right? And, but I think there's some pride and there's some ego there that yes. wants to kind of protect us. Oh, absolutely. And, and like weak and we don't want to get it wrong. And, you know, right. what if? And, you know, that segues. We didn't cover this today, but I, I want to throw it out there. And that is. Sometimes we as adults have our own demons we're working with. You know, we talked a little bit about fear today and parenting from fear. Sometimes we had a tough upbringing 
And we haven't really unpacked that in a way that's been healthy or healing for us. And so sometimes getting our own, or maybe we're dealing with depression or addiction, right? Getting our own support in those areas will heal us and also make us better at coming with those more vulnerable conversations. So cool. I want to give you a minute here uh, because I would love for you to just share um, where people can find you and, and your book. Uh, I've been to your website. Your website is incredible, by the way, and uh, your book and your resources. So my Instagram is Amanda Craig, PhD, and you can find the book. It's on Amazon. Um, it's also in local stores. And then my website, we do have some extra resources and a library of other books that I love. And that's also amandacraigphd.com. And then we have, I have a practice in New York City, Manhattan MFT for marriagefamilytherapy.com. So that's thank awesome. you for having me. I've so enjoyed talking with you. I hope everyone can take one or two nuggets that they find fruitful at home. I'm sure they will. I think this, this podcast was packed with it. Thanks to you. This was really, really awesome. Um, but not to worry guys, we're going to have all the links in the show notes for you. If you want to head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday, one, four, one, we always try to make it very easy for you guys to find again, the dadedge.com forward slash one, four, one, you'll find all of the links for Dr. Amanda Craig, her book, who are you and what have you done with my kid? Connect with your teen while they're still listening. You cannot miss this incredible cover that she has on these yellow headphones that we all see our kids with, with on. Uh, but this was awesome. And I will tell you, um, Dr. Amanda, uh, this selfishly for me, this was so timely and, and so good. And it was just awesome talking to you. Just phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Good you luck bet. to you. I love what you're doing. Thank you. Back at you. Gentlemen, go out and live legendary. Take care.